Okay. So calibration to uh, estimate the, the true underlying parameter value um, tr most commonly is applied in a point estimate sort of way. We arrive at a single estimate of the parameters. Um, there are approaches for a calibration for sure which will estimate confidence intervals. So it will say within you know, 95% confidence the true value lies within this estimate for certain for certain types of assumptions, okay? And most commonly, they, these <coughs> methods are limited by assuming a single dynamic model, um, a single point estimate. Um, uh, they assume, even where you have interval estimates, estimate of confidence intervals, typically they're assuming it's unimodal, meaning there's, there's kind of a, a single, um, area of the of the parameter space which is most likely and it kind of lessens as you go out from there rather than being broadly ambiguous or having a long trench of possibilities that that sort of extends over a broad area or two competing possibilities um, uh, and uh, typically they come along with some some error metric I'm not going to go into that but they assume some sort of uh, um, some sort of characterization of, of the uh, of the errors associated with the uh, the estimate. Um, so today we're going to be talking about this other technique of MCMC, and MCMC is a technique that it falls into the Bayesian category of techniques, and you folks will be familiar with these techniques from past courses of machine learning. Um, and I'm not going to dwell on this too much, but of central importance within MCMC is this construct, which you will know from Bayesian reasoning more generally, of, um, uh, of alternatively thinking about the prior distribution, a distribution um, that we subjectively assess prior to seeing data or seeing the latest data. Um, and then a posterior distribution, which then informs, is the result of informing that subjective estimate created earlier with an updated understanding through our encounter with data. Okay? Takes into account not just the best guesses, but also um, the likelihood that the model, in this case, could be used to explain the data for, for different values. And we're going to see centrally within this technique, the, a prior distribution and a posterior distribution calculated, okay? Okay, now I'd like to introduce some notation that's gonna follow us for this lecture and indeed for the next, okay? The notation lies as follows. Theta, which you should interpret as sort of theta arrow, um, it's, it's a vector in general of parameter values. Um, so a given theta will state, we're gonna make these specific assumptions about the model parameter values, okay? The model parameter values to be estimated. It doesn't have to be all parameters in the dynamic model, although it could be, um, but it may be that there's many of those parameters that have been evidenced solidly or adequately through empirical data, through parameterization. Um, but uh, there may be others that we want to estimate. Um, so through manual parameterization earlier, but there may be others that we want to estimate through, um, uh, through the context of, uh, of, of this MCMC. Okay, so we're going to be uh, estimating them. Okay, secondly, I'm going to introduce the construct of y um, to denote observed values. And the use of this notation is very common within statistics, where commonly we, we, we use y to describe the sort of empirical data, the observed data about the world. Okay? And y, once again, should be interpreted as a vector of observation. It, it may in general be many observations. But we'll use it to denote a vector of observations here 
at a specific time. Okay, so we'll we'll have perhaps observation of the count of people who are currently sick with illness for that time, um, and uh, or potentially so that could be an observation vector. Another observation vector may be for a given time period the number of people that have gotten newly sick with the infection, the number of people that have died with the infection, um, and uh, the number of, of individuals who were um, uh, found to be uh, asymptomatically infected uh, following a long period of, of, uh, of having the infection or what have you. Okay, so we're gonna be operating here. If you think of theta, as the parameter values, a specific assumption of parameter values. Um, we're going to be dealing in terms of prior distributions of our theta, given the observed value in the model, and with posterior distributions, okay? And a posterior distribution here uh, would help us understand, you know, how, if, if I'm to put it intuitively, how likely are different possibilities for theta? This is a distribution over theta. So it's saying, how likely is it that theta has this value or that value or that value in light of the observed data? One, and I will emphasize this because it's one of these things that our lab could explore but haven't yet at the cutting edge. One or more models under consideration. You can actually do MCMC with multiple models where you're considering which model you assume as part of the um, question to be estimated. Um, it's almost like particle theory when you talk in MCMC. You have a thought there that's not unreasonable, but it's it's broader than that. Particle filtering is carried out, as, as we've discussed in past lectures, it's carried out with respect to a single model. It's like saying, look, I, um, my understanding of processes in the world is characterized by this model. And in light of that, what is the data telling me about the state of that model at different times? You know, this, and, and by extension, the state of the world. But I'm sort of putting my confidence in this model, this specific model. With MCMC, in fact, you can have, and it's not trivial to do, there's a, there's a process called reversible jump MCMC, which can be very sophisticated, uh, predicted when the models differ in their parameter spaces. But you can, you can ask, which model should I put my confidence in? Which model of the world? And they, those models will have different characterizations of things, how things happen in the world. Maybe one model involves assuming there's, you know, everyone out there in the, in the um, population who's affected with this, with this pathogen tends to be asymptomatic. Another one assumes, no, there's actually, a, there's actually uh, an, asympto a symptoma an asymptomatic route and a symptomatic route. Um, Another may assume that there are escalating levels of um, likelihood of transmitting the infection the longer you have the, in, the, the infection, whereas other ones do not make that assumption. Those are different competing understanding, not just for what's going on right now, but what, what are the, is the nature of the processes applying out there in the world? And those are alternative models, you know, alternative ways of characterizing behavior in the world that are competing for our fealty. But isn't that every single particle is our understanding of the model? Good question. I love this discussion. Every single, so let's go back to particle filtering. We'll put on our particle filtering hat, okay? Which, which fits me well, I might add, okay? So with my particle filtering hat on, we have a set of competing hypotheses about the world, about, okay, I'm gonna use that term, I'm deliberately using that vaguely, and I'm gonna come back and pin that down. In the particle filter 
we have a set of competing hypotheses for what's going on in the world, right? And each particle, each particle posits a different hypothesis for what's, what's going on in the world. Okay. That's, I sometimes have expressed it that way. No. Well, okay. For particle filtering, each hypothesis is, when I say that each, we have a set of hy competing hypotheses as to what's going on in the world, I'm going to say we have a set to make a, to sharpen that, to make it more specific. With particle filtering, we have a set of competing hypotheses about the current state of the world. Eh? And all of those particles, bar none, every single one of those particles is governed by the same model. They are governed by the same set of rules for how they evolve. They all, they all are choreographed by the same model. Okay? It, what I'm saying here in MCMC is that there are uses of MCMC which, which don't put their confidence in any one model, but where you're actually sampling from models. So it's like we are reserving judgment about which model applies. And just as we reserve judgment about the value of beta that we assume, and we sample different possibilities for the parameter vector, which includes beta, some of those parameter vectors we sample have a higher value of beta, some have a lower value of beta. So those parameter vectors might, might the, from which we draw, might uh, assume one model or might assume a different model. And maybe it turns out, given the evidence, Lassie, that most of them assume, you know, 95% of them assume model a, 4% of the model B, 1% of the model C, and virtually none model D, E, F, G, H, I, J. And I could, I could put it to a two if I wanted to. Um, right? Um, right? So, so these, um, here we, we allow the models to, um, to in fact be something we can, from from whence we say whence we sample, okay, from which we sample, okay. So, so we're not going to get into that in detail today, but you should realize MCMC can do that, and there's there's a technique known as reversal jump MCMC, which is a very sophisticated application of that, okay. Okay, um, so. So again, zooming out a little bit, because we, we, we um, uh, addressed that uh, with some comments here. So here we're dealing, we're sampling theta. We're drawing possible values of theta, where each such value we draw as a vector of particular assumptions about the parameters. In light of the observed data, one or more models under consideration and any pre-existing uh, expectations, uh, so the prior distribution, okay? Um, and then by sampling over theta, we're gonna be able to, for example, calculate the average and the sample mean. Um, uh, or we could ask, what's the probability intervention A is better than intervention B in some criteria? We can arrive at credibility intervals, um, intervals uh, that with 95% probability, uh, it lies within that range, uh, the output lies within that range, et cetera. So we're gonna draw, instead of with calibration, putting all our eggs in the basket of a single best estimate of the parameters, we're going to have a distribution of estimates for parameters. And in very sophisticated cases, we might even consider an, uh, part of that distribution being which model do we believe in, okay? Um, uh, although I, again, I'm not gonna be going uh, into that in detail. Okay, so, so, um, so what is MCMC? Well, 
It's a principled way, principled and actually quite straightforward way, of generating samples from the state, a distribution of theta. So it withdraws values from the posterior distribution over theta, given the empirical evidence in the model, model structure. For, for simplicity in this, the balance of lecture, I'll be emphasizing one model. If there were strong interests, I could talk about how it would be generalized in a separate lecture. But for now, you can assume one, one model. Okay? Um, and the idea here is that, that we're going to generate these samples again and again and again. So it, it uses the term Monte Carlo. Okay? Monte Carlo referring to a, to a uh, country within Europe that's famous for casinos. Where, where, where people you know, go and, and it's kind of like a tax on people who are bad at math. They gotta go there and they pull an arm and they, you know, they stick money into a machine and it takes their money. And occasionally one will be rewarded and, and the others get excited and put more money into their machine. That's, that's the basic abstraction of, of a casino. Uh, and Monte Carlo has tons of casinos um, that are that are just generating random, you know, things involving cherries and apples and so on on the on the screen, and um, and, uh, and and it's like that here. We draw again and again and again, much as the one-armed bandits keep on putting out random samples from their distribution of cherries, apples, and whatever else is shown, oranges. Um, okay. Um, so, um, this is going to be the basic uh, operation of it. Now, people, when they first come to Markov Chain Monte Carlo, often will find it hard to, to understand this name, Markov Chain Monte Carlo, because it doesn't seem to be an, off, uh, an obvious Markov Chain, and it's not clear what Monte Carlo has to do with it. Monte Carlo is, again, we're drawing, we're, we're, we're sort of drawing these samples again and again and again and again. These techniques in simulation are sometimes, or sorry, in statistics are sometimes called simulation techniques. Uh, they evolve, so they're called Monte Carlo simulation. Even if they're not over time, they involve successive things. They involve successively drawing samples, okay? And conceptually, there's a Markov chain that lies behind this that we'll refer to. Um, there's a Markovian system where it has a current state and it picks the next state based on prior the prior distribution of possible candidates compared to the current prior distribution. So there's a, there's a current thing and there's transitions to possible other values with various probabilities. And that gives it its name Monte Carlo, oh, sorry, its name Markov chain, okay? The, we don't actually show a there's no depiction of a Markov chain. We're not, we don't have a big data structure that says, you know, this is the structure of a Markov chain. The Markov chain is actually in general in continuous space and we would not be able to, you know, continuous values of parameters, we wouldn't be able to represent it nicely in a table. Okay. Um, okay. So, High level operation, how do we use MCMC with a simulation model? Well, first of all, and this is really important, and it lays the groundwork for our next lecture. MCMC stands in contrast to particle filtering with respect to the characteristics of the model with which it's appropriate to use. So, so that is the type of English up with which I will not put. So um, MCMC and parameter filtering make very different assumptions about one critical feature of the model. To wit, with particle filtering, we assumed, and indeed Coleman filtering, we assumed that a model was stochastic. It didn't make sense to use those techniques with a model that's not stochastic. 
I mean, at a very practical level, a model that wasn't stochastic used without particle filtering, as soon as you went through a resampling process which cloned a particle and to have many children, remember, particle filtering is survival, uh, associated with the survival of the fittest, the fruitful multiply into many, many copies of themselves. And those copies would all remain exactly the same if there weren't stochastics in the law, right? So that's kind of a hand wavy reason um, but <coughs> that we need stochastics for particle filtering model. But particle filtering at its heart deals with model uncertainty and that's represented in the form of stochastics as a key element, okay? Not the only way, but it's, it's a key way. By con so particle filtering, you're using state space, estimating position of a model at the current time in state space by drawing samples, and uh, these samples are called particles, and it evolves stochastically. By contrast, MCMC, you're making sample estimates in parameter space, and you're using that to estimate the, the distribution over parameter space, associated with the model in light of empirical evidence. And critically, and this is the key thing, I'm trying to emphasize, it's undertaken with deterministic models. Deterministic models, ladies and gentlemen, for MCMC, okay? Um, okay, um, so high level operation. Uh, if we have a deterministic model, uh, we up front, we make a decision about a prior distribution of our parameters. This is this subjective distribution that we, we judge, okay, what are probable values of you know, priors uh, associated with parameters? Ideally, you would specify this um, with a uh, with a multi-dimensional, uh, with a joint distribution um, that's explicitly joint, but often we piece what we identify prior distribution for each parameter in isolation and, and just assume that the joint distribution is a result of multiplication of, of those, of those marginal distributions. So we, in short, we make some prior assumptions. As with Bayesian techniques in general, the anticipation is that these prior distributions, the assumptions involved in them will be overwhelmed by the data as the data starts coming in. So often we don't really, you know, tie ourselves in knots up about what our prior distributions are. Critically, and more importantly yet, we formulate likelihood formulae that, that basically ask what's the, what's the likelihood of seeing some empirical datum, some vector of empirical values, um, uh, in this case it's gonna be over time, in light of the values of parameters in simulation model output, okay? Um, uh, so, so if we have a certain set of parameter values. We, we say the parameters are this certain value, theta, um, and we have this simulation model. We'll ask, what's the likelihood we will observe this given observable? I want to make a distinction here. Within particle filtering, this is actually a really important one. I may have misspoken earlier, so I want, to be, want people to be clear about it. In particle filtering, we are dealing with observations that occur at a certain time, right? So we have a, an observation that is made at a given time t. Or you may remember from my slides on particle filtering, I use k to be the kth observation. So the first observation, y sub 1, a second, y sub 2. And this is indicative of the time point of the observation, okay? That was in particle filtering. Okay. 
And we were using that because we were trying to estimate at the update step, we were trying to sample from, estimate the underlying state of the system at time point k. We are trying to estimate what is the underlying state of the system at this time, and we were using data from this time to do that. A new datum arrived, a vector of values at time k, time point k, observation point k. With MCMC, we're going to be, we're not going to be doing this at, at each time point separately. We're going to have a blunter observation vector, y. It's going to be an observation vector. And it's not going to be time point specific. Now, it may have elements within it that relate to the value, observed value of the system at a certain time. That's fine. But we're not going to have a separate observation vector that we consider while running the model at time k, and another one we consider at time k plus 1, and another one while we're running the model at time k plus 2. We're not going to have anything like that. We're going to run the model as a whole. Boom! And, and we're going to ask, How does the model's output compare to the vector of observations across all time? Okay, So we're not going to be going recursively, as we were in particle filtering, considering each new datum as it arrives, and asking, what is it telling us about the current time? What is it whispering to us about what's going on? With, PMC, with MCMC, instead we are We are having an observation vector that relates to the entire course of model evolution or the entire time horizon, and we can compare it against model output for that time horizon, but we're not considering it in little bits and batches. We're considering it as a whole. Okay? So we're going to have an observation vector. Okay? The empirical datum here is, is one big observation vector. Empirical data is one big observation. Okay, and then we're going to be um, applying Bayes' rule conceptually to, to get the posterior, to recognize the posterior is proportional to the product of the likelihood and the prior. Okay, um, and um, we're then going to use this conceptual Markov chain to generate samples from theta uh, uh, successively over time. And we're going to seek to do so until the system is asymptotic stationarity, has, exhibits asymptotic stationarity until it converges to kind of the appropriate distribution. Okay. Um, right. Um, now, I talked about last time, from this very floor, that it is challenging to draw samples from an arbitrary distribution um, without using algorithms to, to help you. In general, if I have an arbitrary cumulative distribution function, for example, that's multi-dimensional, uh, 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 I can sample, even if it's multi-dimensional, I can sample from it. But in general, um, we're going to have a posterior, and the value of the posterior, we're going to be able to determine for a given value of theta. We're going to be able to assess for a given value of theta, the posterior P or theta. Oh. What am I doing? That's phi. Yeah, uh, phi or phi. I don't know where pho and phone went, but um, um, here. Okay. Um, so p of theta given y. Um, if this is our posterior, 
we're going to be able to calculate what the value of this is um, for a given theta. We could say this one is, has a value of probability density higher than this other one, higher than this other one. But then how do we sample it? How do we sample from it? How do we get samples with a probability proportional uh, to that is, is more challenging. And this is exactly what this process of Markov chain Monte Carlo allows us to do. It allows us to generate samples of the parameter values from the posterior without knowing the, the CDF uh, in advance, okay? Um, now, now, the heart of determining the value of this guy, of this posterior, lies in Bayes' rule, okay? Uh, so we have this posterior we want to, want to compute, okay? Um, and that's on the left-hand side here. And we, we want to be able to compute that for a given theta. What is the value of it? Once we compute it, we'll be able to sample from it according to the Markov chain. But, but we need to compute this. We need to have a particular value for a given theta. What is the value of P of theta given one? Okay? That's what we want to be able to calculate. You give me a theta, I need to be able to tell you what is P of theta given Y. By the way, this is for a particular model. So you could say given Y and the model. Okay? Um, and base rule is a very simple rule that falls directly out of the definitions, basic definitions associated with um, probability. Um, and uh, I think you're probably familiar with this, but I'll, in case this always has just struck you as a weird formula to memorize, it should. This should be able to be something you can immediately rederive, and I'll, I'll tell you why you should be able to rederive it. Um, so in general, if we have P of A, B, P of A and B, right? Uh, so X is three and Y is four, or A is true and B is false, or whatever, um, B is true. Um, in general, if we, wanna, if we wanna ask what is the probability um, of, of them being true in general, this is equal to, by definition, of conditional probability it's P of A given B times what? P of B, right? Mm hmm? Okay? Now, it so happens that P of A, B is the same as P of B, A, right? Right? And, and so I could just as easily write this as P of B A. So both these things are true. So either either way, P of B A times P of A, right? Mm -hmm. And it, these things are true. So these things equal that, right? So if we have P of A given B, P of B equals P of B given A, P of A, I can always express here this guy, P of A given B, as just P of B given A, P of A divided by P of B, right? And that's all this is here. That's all this is. I mean, if you, if you think about it this way, here's another way to think about it. On the right-hand side, take this, multiply both sides by P of Y. This denominator goes away on the right-hand side. It appears on the left-hand side. So on the left-hand side, we have P of theta given Y times P of Y. What is that? That's P of theta Y, right? It's the joint probability of observing both uh, theta and Y. 
And on the right side, you have p of y given theta times p of theta. What is that? That's p of y theta or p of theta y. So on both sides, it's the same. So this is this is this has to be true, <laughs> and this is Bayes' rule, and Bayes formulated it. Um, okay. Um, okay. So, but it has great implications, and a key thing here is that. The left hand side is posterior. It's asking, it's asking about um, what's the probability of theta having seen y in light of uh, light of y, okay? Um, and p of theta, p of y given theta on the right hand side is the likelihood, okay? It's asking for a given theta. If we have a given theta that secretly applies, what's the likelihood we would observe y? Right? P of theta is, is sub prior. This is, this is what this reflects the distribution we associate with theta prior to seeing the, the actual empirical data y. So hence prior. Um, it's before we encounter the data, what's our belief about theta, right? And then there's this P of Y. Now the key thing here is that P of Y doesn't depend on theta. P of Y is just some constant. Yeah, for different Y, it'd be different constants. But here, if we're dealing with a single obs observation about the world, a single Y, we have a single observation about the world. P of Y is some just, it's just some value. So, so there's some denominator here. We don't know what it is, but what we do know is that the left-hand side is proportional to the right-hand side by some constant that doesn't depend on theta. So if we want to ask how, what is the ratio of P of theta given Y for theta 1 versus theta 2. Well, they're both with respect to the same y. And hence, these constants will, will cancel, OK? Um, uh, so, so we don't have to worry about, about uh, the p of y in the denominator. Let's put it this way. We're gonna, I'm just going to write down this formula here. So. Writing down the formula to the left, just to make this very, very clear, P of theta 1 given Y equals P of Y given theta 1 times P of theta 1, right, divided by P of Y, right? P of theta 2 given y equals, and it's just the same thing except substitute theta 2 for theta 1, right? If you divide P of theta 1 given y divided by P of theta 2 given y, With, with theta 2 instead of theta 1, right? Instead of theta 1, right? If you divide these two, these P of Y's cancel. In the denominator, they just cancel, they go away. So this ratio is independent of the denominator of P of Y. It doesn't depend on P of Y. And it's this ratio that we're going to be using. We're actually not going to be able to compute the posterior, but we'll compute the, sort of the relative value of the posterior that's off by some constant, perhaps, by, by, uh, compared to its true value. Um, and the point is we're going to be operating in terms of these ratios. Okay, And these ratios will have their value the same regardless of what or whatever p of y is. Because p of y cancels when you divide. This is the division, right? Yeah. Okay. Um, 
Okay. Okay, so this is basically what we're going to do. Um, the basic deal here is that let's suppose that we have, so in the Markov chain, we're going to be having a certain point where we're at right now, a value of theta that we think is, we've already sampled. And we're going to try to figure out, do we emit this one again, or do we jump to a new one? A, a new one that I'll call a candidate. Okay, so we have a candidate and we're gonna say, how good is that candidate? If the candidate's really good relative to the current one, we'll have a high likelihood of jumping to it. Okay? Uh, in fact, if the candidate is better than this one, we'll definitely jump to it. Okay? By contrast, if the candidate is less good than this, we might jump to it, but with a, low, with a lower probability. Okay? Um, so the idea here is that we're going to be examining our current point in the Markov chain and the value sort of re-emitting this versus going to a new point with a candidate. Now in order to assess the candidate, in order to decide whether or not to go to the candidate, we're going to look at the relative value of the posteriors for my current point and the candidate point. And taking advantage of the freedom, one might say the license of the whiteboard, I'm going to actually draw, instead of theta one and theta two, I'm going to write this as theta star, that will be a candidate, okay? And I wanna make sure I'm using the, 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 the value that, I'm, that I uh, chose. So I have, a, I have a candidate value and I have the current value. And I'm going to look at the candidate compared to the current, the ratio of the posterior of the two of them, okay? The, the candidate to the current. And I may have used a different notation, so I'm going to be, I'm going to be cautious about this, okay? Um, I'll change this back until I remember the notation because I don't want to confuse you. So how are we going to do this? Well, it turns out we're going to run the simulation model for each, okay? And the simulation is going to provide this key link that's going to tell us for a given set of parameter values, a given theta, it's going to produce for us what the consequences of that is over time. Okay? So it's going to tell us if we assume these values of parameter, simulation is going to tell what the behavior of the model is. Right? We just simulate the model for those parameters. And then, based on the model outputs, we'll be able to compute the values of the likelihood. Okay? Um, so, so, once we've run the simulation model, we see the output from it, we see what it results at different points in time, we'll be able to compute uh, the value of the uh, the candidate, so p of, of y given theta times p of p of theta, okay? Um, so, so p of y given theta is the likelihood, and computing that, what's the likelihood of observing this empirical datum given theta? To, in order to compute that, we need to understand what the consequences of theta are over time. We need to run the simulation model and see if we assume theta as the parameter values, what does this imply about model behavior? And then, knowing that about model behavior, we could typically have a little likelihood function that computes what's the likelihood of observing this empirical datum given the model behavior that results from theta, okay? And then, um, so we'll be able to compute that likelihood and multiply it by theta to compute the posterior of the candidate. 
and then we accept or reject the candidate based on the ratio of posteriors between the candidate and the current, the current point, okay? If the candidate has uh, a value of the posterior above the current place, we always go to it. Probability one, we travel to it. By contrast, if the ratio of the posterior is less than one, we will go to it only with that probability of the, of the ratio, okay? And, and then we'll, we'll run this again and again, okay? Um, and I'll, I'll show this in a, um, in a diagram in an algorithmic form, okay? Did you have a question, Levy? Uh, it's a good question. But isn't that like, uh, what I understand is with this technique, we really try to aiming to get a, a close to the likelihood, you know, try to approach into that value. So mm. as far as understanding, if we, when we try to tune in based on the likelihood function, yeah. it's really easy to get into the case of overfeeding. Well, okay, but the key thing here, so it's a very good question, but the key thing that I want to emphasize is we don't always go in the direction of better fitting. Remember that, that if we're already at a good place, let's suppose maybe it's best to illustrate this with, with this. If we're already a good place, suppose we're at P of theta. Um, suppose we're already, I say current point is, is P of theta here. Um, uh, suppose we're at P of theta, okay? Um, we're at a pretty good place. We're a lot better than way over here at the right, et cetera. Um, let's suppose we were to consider, although I have down a, a candidate being shown here, suppose we were to consider this as a candidate where the, where the mouse is, right? Um, where my hand is there. Um, if we were to consider that, there's a chance we'll move there. Um, and uh, in fact, it's a probability of greater than a half we'll move there. So it's more than a coin flip. Um, because if we're here, and this has a, a given um, uh, value for the posterior. This is the, I put P of X as the posterior value here. I have to be careful because I was using that to indicate the, uh, the same notation. I should use a different P. This is, imagine this is the value of the posterior at this point. That's the Y axis. And now consider the value of the posterior at this point. The value of posterior at this point is maybe Judging by this axis, maybe two thirds, maybe three quarters of the way up to this one. So we'll actually have, if we're here, we'll have a significant chance, more than half of going down. If we reach this point, if we, if we go and we say, how about this point? And even in this trough, will we go there? The probability is more than half that we will. It's like two thirds or three quarters. By contrast, if we if we pick this one as a candidate, what's the probability we'll go to that? It's certain we'll go to that. So remember that when we're here, we're not always just going towards the greater one. We're not always engaged in just hill climbing. We're not always putting our eggs in the basket of getting better and better fit. We're actually choosing a strategy here. This strategy that I've described, which is illustrated here, in more detail um, doesn't always bring us in the direction of increasing. Um, sometimes it will actually bring us in the direction of decreasing our posterior value. Um, it's just, it's more likely we'll go in the direction of increasing. But we will be seeking to explore this space more generally um, in a um, uh, in a way that doesn't privilege just very high posterior density regions, and that's how we avoid overfitting. It's it's 
actually making sure we explore the whole space and sampling things here. Now, the amazing thing, and this can be proven without actually a very complicated proof, um, is that this strategy that I'm describing, the key property is it allows us to sample from the posterior um, in a way that is that mirrors the well, by definition, we're sampling from the posterior. The probability of getting a value within a certain range is proportional to the to the um, amount of probability mass within that range in the posterior. So we will get lots of samples for these peaks, but we'll also get quite a few samples from these areas, and we'll get some samples from these. And so, in other words, we'll be sampling from this with a probability density given by the, the peaks, these peaks. Okay, That's what this actually accomplishes, and that's the amazing thing. Um, so, so here, this is a, a description of the basic algorithm, okay? We're going to pick some initial theta. We got to get some initial theta, which has a non-zero value of occurrence. We need to find some theta whose posterior is not zero, okay? Um, because if the posterior were zero, it would cause big problems in this step here because it would be a divide by zero, okay? Um, so we have to arrive at some value of theta, okay? And, and then again and again and again and again, it's typically tens of thousands <laughs> of times or hundreds of thousands of times, we are going to, and this is a key part, this is called the this is one of the most basic and probably by far the most common version of this MCMC algorithm. Ultimately, it's one of many, but it's one that's really easy to understand. So if we have a current value of theta, okay, we're going to randomly perturb it. We're going to pick a value that's different than it. So if this is our theta, we will randomly pick a perturbation to it. We'll draw it from a distribution. Maybe it's a normal distribution. It's the most common one. Remember, theta could be, could have a vector of, could be associated with a vector of like 20, right? In which case, it's a multi-dimensional normal distribution in dimension 20. And we'll pick it from that, okay? Uh, so here, we will have this random walk standard deviation, which Shayan has worked with a lot, um, uh, which given a current theta, will pick an, a, a candidate theta, okay? This is shown in 1D, but in general, it's occurring in multi-D, right? So if, I'm, if, if it's in 3D, here's my current place, Maybe, maybe my head is the, is the current place, if you don't mind. And I'm going to pick a random perturbation to that according to a multidimensional normal distribution. So maybe it's far away this way, but quite close this way. And, and uh, you know, it's, it's not too far up, right? And I'll pick different candidate values on my at, at different places relative to my current position. So I'm going to pick a, a so-called perturbation of this. It's like this current point plus a draw from a multi-dimensional normal distribution centered at zero. So I, I pick a sort of nearby point. Okay? So we just pick one of them or we can pick multiple? No, we pick one at a time. For each iteration to this loop, we pick one. And that gives us the candidate value. This is a candidate, okay, this theta tilde. We haven't yet committed to the candidate. We're just evaluating this candidate. So we're at a current point, we pick a candidate, and then we say, should we go to that candidate or should we stick where we are? 
by the way, this is going to turn into, should we go to that candidate? Should we go to and emit that candidate and say, this is our next sample, or should our next sample just be where we are and we stay here? Okay, those two kind of go together. So here's our current point. We pick some candidate. You know, it's like I, I reach, it's, it's like last Friday, right? It's like last Friday. We reached into that bag and we grabbed the number, right? So we pick some candidate, right? <laughs> I was number three, right? I picked a candidate. Um, okay, now, we're not vested in that candidate yet, right? Um, did Alex steal someone? I can't remember. Anyway, um, so we're not vested in this. We have a candidate. How do we know whether or not we'll accept that candidate, whether or not we'll go to that candidate, whether that candidate will become our current point? Well, we examine the posterior distribution for the candidate, and we compare it to the posterior distribution at the current place. Okay? That's, that's this one here. Okay? That's our, our current place. Um, and uh, that's theta sub i. So we're going to consider that ratio, the posterior at the candidate versus the posterior at the current place. Okay. If the value at the candidate has a posterior that's greater than ours, then the ratio of the posteriors will be greater than 1. The minimum of that at 1 will be 1. It will automatically go there. Otherwise, in any case, we'll draw a value uniform probability between 0 and 1. We'll assume we can do that. We, we draw a value, a random value between 0 and 1. Um, and if that's less than the minimum of one in this ratio of posteriors, we'll, we'll go to the candidate, otherwise not. So if the candidate has a value of posterior greater than, than a current one, this minimum of one in that ratio will be one, and we'll, and we'll automatically go to the candidate. This uniform draw will automatically be less than or equal to one, because its maximum value is one. By contrast, if posterior at the candidate is, say, half the value of the current posterior, the ratio will be 1 over 2, half. The minimum of 1 and 1 half is half. And with probability half, we will go to that candidate. So with probability half, we'll go downhill to that candidate. Mm -hmm. Now, if we accept the candidate, if we go to that candidate, that becomes our next sample. And that's our current spot from, for the next round. That's where we are the next round. We will shift to be at this position, for example. That's where our current place will be the next round. But we will also emit that as our sample. We'll say, this is our sample. By contrast, if we reject the candidate, we just stay where we are, and we will emit, re-emit the current place. We will say again, okay? And so we emit it, and then we keep on going. And then we will pick a different candidate, and we will decide whether or not to emit that and go there. So we keep on iterating, iterating, iterating. Okay. Couple points. In terms of intuition, if we're at a good place, if we're at a very good place, let's say a peak of one of these hills, we won't always stay there, right? With if we pick something that's halfway has only half that value, we'll still go there with probability of a half. So we still will explore. We won't be stuck in the best places only. We will still explore. That's key, one key intuition. We'll still be exploring this. We won't always just stick with the best. Secondly, if we are at a very good place, chances are that 
we may stick here for a couple times before going on, right? I mean, so yes, we'll have a half chance of going to this one, for example, if it's half the value, but there's a half chance we'll stay here. So we'll tend to spend a longer amount of time in good places. Just we'll eventually move on from them, but we'll spend a lot of time. And while we're there, we'll keep on re-emitting that sample. We'll, we'll stick there, and until we move, we're going to keep on repeating it. That will mean these peaks will tend to have a lot of, the, a lot of times they'll appear in the data. There'll be a lot of samples from the values that are pretty high up. By contrast, if, if, if we're way down here, you know, in a, in, a, in a low area here, we could be there. We could get there even from a pretty high point in it. And if we're here, we'll admit them. It's not that we'll never see it, but chances are we won't spend too long here before we move on. So we'll tend to have fewer samples from these low points, right? From these low points. We'll tend to have fewer samples than from the high points. We'll be spending more of our time around the high points because we kind of gravitate towards them, but we'll still make sure we explore the low points and when we spend time in the low points, we'll emit samples from them. So what I'm saying is that at an intuitive level, you could start to see why this doesn't only sample from high points. It does explore. It, it doesn't stay conceited in these high points. And at the same time, you'll understand that the high points in the distribution will tend to have many samples compared to the low points because we'll tend to go to them and we're more likely to stick around them for at least some time before we go on because they have a, a quite favorable um, a posterior value related to, to nearby points. Okay? Yeah? Is it possible to stay at the highest point and stay there for a long time? Let's say the next time we get a sample with W, we go W, but then we go back up. Oh, yeah, it's quite... It's, it's possible, it's possible. Remember that when we're at, so yeah, I mean, quite often we'll, like, we might go here, then we might go here, and then maybe we'll go here, and, and, and maybe, maybe we'll stick there again, and then we'll go over here, and we're kind of jumping around. Remember, it, it, it might bear emphasis, there's two random components here. One is, how is this perturbation? In other words, you're picking a random point around you, right? Um, and, and picking that as your candidate. And the second perturbation is, okay, once you pick the candidate, do you go or not? And that's based on the ratio of posteriors. I want to build another intuition, which is actually a really important practical intuition, okay? Very important practical intuition when you're performing this in MCMC and indeed particle, particle MCMC. Okay. Let's consider the effect of picking. A sm consider a, the effect of a small perturbation versus a long perturbation, okay? So, I want to get my head out of the way. Um, okay, so let's consider we're at this current point. Now let's consider we have a very small perturbation. Okay, it's very, very small deviation from this. So we pick values uh, from you know, we pick a perturbation in, in theta that's very, draw from a very small uh, multidimensional normal distribution. So maybe it tends to pick things only in this tiny region here, right? Right? Um, take a look at how P varies in that region. If, if you consider a very, very, very thin perturbation, very small, very local, almost minute, puny, tiny, infinitesimal. What will the ratio of the posterior be 
for the new point compared to the current point? It'll be very close to what? To one, right? If I, if I consider you know, a bigger perturbation, I may go here, I may go here, there's quite a variation in the value of P over this, this range. If, I, if I'm only doing a super tiny one here, the, ratio, the values of P within this tiny range are so close that the posteriors have almost the same value. So this ratio will be just about one. What does that mean if this ratio is just about one? Well, I tend to go or not go a lot. Go. Exactly. So for nearby, if I have very, very small perturbations here, I will tend to follow them with, with almost near certainty. Small perturbations lead to a very high acceptance rate. I will almost always take them up because the value of the posterior is almost the same as for me, and so I'll almost always go there. Look, it may be down a little bit, right? I mean, it's not to say it won't go down a little bit it's from here to here, but it'll be like 0.98 chance of going, 0.96, 0.99. So I'm still very likely to go there, right? Yeah, so it's slightly beneath it, but it's like 0.99. I mean, still, you flip a coin, it's almost certain I'll, I'll, I'll go, right? Even if it's slightly downhill, slightly uphill, I'll go. If it's uphill, I'll go, for sure. If it's slightly downhill, I'll still very likely go. So they tend to lead to very high acceptance rates with small perturbations. By contrast, if I have a big perturbation in theta, I'm much less likely to observe it. Imagine, imagine I had a really big one, right? Uh, like, like perturbations on kind of like this size, right? So here I am, and it's like I choose one over there. This is going down. You, you think it's likely I'll go there? Nah, because the value of the posterior is going really low down. Over, over here, you think it's likely I'll go? No, no. Uh, it'll be a while before I get to a, a good Goldilocks one, which has that nice combination. Now, something of medium size, uh, well, I'll, I'll, it's certainly better than one with really far, which might lend me out in no man's land there. But, you know, I'll still often reject it because I may be going to something that's much lower than my current one. I might go to something that's higher than my current. Maybe I'm down here and, you know, I may go to that, but a lot of them will be, you know, off if it's pretty big. But as, theta, as the perturbation becomes smaller, I'll tend to tend generally to have a higher chance of, of uh, getting it than a really large perturbation, higher chance of acceptance. As the perturbation becomes very, very small, the, my chance of accepting will go towards one. It's almost certain I'll accept it. So, so this algorithm, if we have a small perturbation, has very high acceptance rates. Now, you need to think about this in light of something practical. Our goal with MCMC is to sample from theta, okay, from the posterior distribution of theta, associated with theta. We're going to be sampling from it. We want to explore this space. We want to sample from this space. We want to travel through the space, explore it well, explore it without prejudice, sort of try different values, spending more time where it's high posterior. That's the definition of sampling from the posterior. But we still don't want to like totally neglect some regions, like totally forget about them, even though they're non-zero posterior. No, if, if it has non-zero posterior, we want to explore it with the appropriate probability not to spend, spend too much time there, not to not spend too little. Okay, so imagine you want us to explore this. Now, suppose we have limited time. One thing that will help us explore it is if we, 
if we have a high acceptance rate, right? If they're all, if we have an acceptance rate of close to zero, we're not going to be moving, right? We're, we're almost not going to be moving. If we have an acceptance rate that's too small, we'll almost always stay where we are, just re-emit the current thing. We'll, we'll be, it's like we're shut in. We're, we're, we're not going anywhere. We're just staying where we are. Staying where we are. Um, because everything else looks so much worse. Right? Um, so if, the, accept, if the, the acceptance rate is too low, we won't be moving. What's one way the acceptance rate will be low? If we have too big a, a perturbation, the acceptance rate will be low. Right? Too big a perturbation, I argued, will make the acceptance rate low. If it's like this and this, you know, it's like... I can barely even reach it, you know, if, 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 I, if I have things on, on that order, I'll have a very low acceptance rate. So if my random walk standard deviation is, is too high, I'll tend to have low acceptance rate and therefore I won't move. It's kind of ironic, right? Because if I moved, I would move very far, <laughs> but because the candidates are being considered at such huge distance, they are like unlikely to have a high posterior. They're likely to have a very low posterior. I'm unlikely to move there, right? I'm, 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 I'm very unlikely. To, the ratio of posteriors is low, and therefore I'm very unlikely to move there. By contrast, if I consider a very small perturbation size, very small random walk standard deviation here, very small perturbation size, then I'm very likely to move there, but I'll move very small. Do you see that? I'll move very small distance. Imagine I have a tiny perturbation in you know, the size of a pixel. It's like a stand that's the standard deviation of the, of the multidimensional normal I'm drawing from. It's a pixel size. Almost certainly I'll move there to each new candidate. But I'll move such small distance, I won't explore very quickly either. So there is a Goldilocks principle here that needs to be tuned. And this is of overwhelming importance for MCMC, for practical MCMC. This is like where my head is almost all the time when I'm doing MCMC and PMCMC. How to get to that Goldilocks principle, how to, how to approach the Goldilocks state in terms of the perturbation size. Perturbation size too small, very high acceptance rate because the posterior will be just about the same. The value of the posterior will be just, and the ratio of it will be one. The values of the posterior will be just about the same. But I move very small amount, and so I'm not going to explore the space quickly. It's going to take tons of samples. Sampling again and again and again as I as I goes, you know, up to 10,000, 100,000, a million, just to explore the space. I'm gonna need a ton of samples to explore the space, a ton of candidates where, yes, I then move, but they're moving so slowly that it's, it's like an ant, right? Um, by contrast, if I have too big, uh, I will have a very low acceptance rate. That won't be good either because I'll almost never move. I'll almost always just stay at the same place. So too small, high acceptance rate, low exploration of space. Too large, standard deviation, very low acceptance rate, very low exploration of the space. Either one of those extremes is not going to let me explore the space well. Neither one will let me meaningfully explore the space quickly. So I want to find a perturbation, this theta, this delta theta. I want to find a kind of way of perturbing it that's at the right scale. So it's, I'll, I'll get acceptance quite a bit, but I'm moving, if I do get acceptance, I've moved enough that it's, 
that it's going to add up. It's going to be a meaningful exploration of this space. Um, so it's going to be at a scale that will allow me to explore this space. Now, there's a whole literature about how do you do this efficiently. And there's big disagreements by different true experts in this area. Um, some I've heard advocate for an acceptance rate, the Goldilocks acceptance rate, somewhere around upper 20s. I think Galman in his book, Bayesian Data Analysis, argues for an acceptance rate of like 29%. Shoot for an acceptance rate of 29%. Big enough that you're going to explore the space, but small enough, uh, but it's, and big enough acceptance rate that you'll have a high chance of accepting it. By contrast, others have advocated acceptance rates up closer to 75% or 80%. You can get that by, by you know, smaller perturbations. You won't go as far, but because you accept it more frequently, um, you'll, your effective rate of travel will be higher. Because after all, what's a rate of travel if you never do the traveling, right? Um, what's the use of a big perturbation if you never accept it? So, MCMC, the practical pursuit of MCMC is all about achieving convergence. It's exploring the space enough that you have adequately sampled from it. And to assess this, you look all the time at what are called trace plots, which show over time for a given parameter, what are the values of the parameter from which you've sampled across all the different samples you've considered? And you want to see that you're not just kind of switching between different areas of space and never coming back. You're kind of exploring all different values of these parameters very thoroughly, coming back and forth and back and forth. And, and going back and forth, you're not, you don't just see two modes where you're like up here for a while and then you're like here and that's all you see. Instead, you want to see it kind of going back and forth. You've run it long enough, it's well mixed, as we say. It's well mixed and it's exploring. So that requires balancing acceptance rate with, with perturbation size to get that nice balance so you actually explore it, okay? Um, so it turns out there's very nice theory as to why this works. There's only one stationary distribution for the Markov chain. Um, and the actual posterior is uh, a stationary distribution. Um, and um, and it's, it, it turns out it's a very powerful technique because we are sampling from the posterior distribution over theta. Now, in my recent comments here, I have brushed under the rug. Where is the simulation model? Where is this going on? I mean, okay, so we've been talking about exploring this. Where's the simulation? Where's our model? Where's our dynamic model here? Well, our dynamic model, ladies and gentlemen, is being executed each time we evaluate a posterior. Why is it being evaluated each time we evaluate the posterior? Because of this, ladies and gentlemen, the value of the posterior is given by the value, the likelihood times the value for the prior. So if we want to assess for a given theta, what's the posterior probability of that theta given y? We just determine that as the product of the likelihood function. What's the likelihood we observe the empirical data given the the the, the uh, value of theta, the, those parameter values, times the prior. And then there's some constant. And I argue that the constant disappears when you're using these ratios. So we are running the, val the simulation model to compute this and compute this, and more specifically the posterior. And we're specifically running it to compute the likelihood. So, why are we running it to compute the likelihood?
because in general, when we have a simulation model, it's not possible to ask, what's the likelihood of observing, um, I'll, I'll pick an example, let's use the model that's up there on the board. Um, so we have a model, an SCIR model, where we have a beta, a C, a tau, and an omega. Okay, that's what we had here, you can imagine. If we were to ask, what's the likelihood that we would observe certain observations from the world over time, say the number of infected people in successive days, uh, for a given parameter factor, and that's what the likelihood is. It's saying, what's the likelihood we would observe this many people reported as ill on successive days, given a particular theta shown here. How do I evaluate that without a simulation model? The only way to evaluate it is by plugging these into the simulation model, running the simulation model, seeing what the simulation model produces in terms of number of ill people on a per day basis, and then asking, okay, given that, if that number of people were truly ill on those days, or that number of people uh, were becoming ill on those days, what's the likelihood we would observe the empirical data? Okay, so, so here, it's in the calculation of P of theta given, P of Y given theta, the likelihood that we compute, that, that we perform the simulation, okay? Um, so, and fundamentally, the model is taking a parameter vector and turning it into dynamic behavior. That's what the model does. That's what a dynamic model does. It takes our parameter assumptions and it runs the model with those assumptions and says, this is what results from the endogenous behavior of the model. This is what results. Um, and once we have those results, then we can start to formulate a likelihood function. So this likelihood function, this likelihood, we can only compute it in general by running the model, asking about the consequences over time implied by the model for these parameters, and then saying what's the probability that we observe these empirical data given that model behavior that comes from the from from theta. Incidentally, this is why the model should be deterministic, so that that theta implies a specific model output, and we're assessing with the likelihood function the likelihood that we would observe certain empirical data given that model output. Okay. Um, okay. Um, right. Okay, like the formulas. Um, right, so, mm -hmm. yeah, so suppose the simulation model, for example, here is one of tuberculosis. Um, and the simulation model has certain parameters associated with it, and it has a stock of diagnosed individuals uh, with TB. Um, at a given time t. Um, maybe we have empirical data regarding the number of individuals at different times who are diagnosed with tuberculosis. So that's a long, that's a long observation vector y for different periods of time. Particle filtering, we're looking at it in small pieces recursively for different points in time. Here, we're considering a, an observation vector over across all time and we're asking, what's the likelihood we would observe that long vector from the parameters? In order to understand that, we run the simulation model with those parameters, and we get out values of the stocks at different times on the number of people who would be infected with TB when we assume these parameters for different points of time. And then we would express the likelihood uh, that a given count of individuals uh, is reported as being with, with TB at a given time for the empirical datum. Um, and we formulate this likelihood perhaps with a binomial distribution or with a negative binomial, much as we do in, 
and uh, particle filtering. So here we are using the simulation model to tell us the dynamic consequences of these parameter assumptions and then having those dynamic behaviors, the values of the stocks at each point in time, determined, then we determine the value of the likelihood that, that you'd observe this given those values of the stocks. So we use the simulation model to go from parameter values. So the simulation model here goes from parameter values to, um, to state of world of world uh, over time. This is the simulation. And, and then the likelihood function uh, here will be, um, will we'll we'll, uh, allow you to compute P of Y given theta. So this is, uh, this is likelihood function. Uh, we will compute, we choose our likelihood and, and evaluate this. So this is for a simulation, the simulation for a, for a given theta, the simulation allows us to say what is the state of the world and the likelihood operates in terms of the state of the world and it gives us this probability. So, that, so that's how this is operating together, okay, with the likelihood formulas. Um, so running the simulation model, the simulation model is run every time we compute a posterior. Now, if we're at the current place here, we've already computed the posterior. We don't have to compute it again. So if, if we're just sitting at the current place, we don't have to compute the posterior for that place um, when comparing it. What we have to do is compute the posterior for the candidate. So every time we choose a candidate, we say, what's the value of the posterior for that candidate? Or, or what's the ratio of the value of the posteriors for that candidate compared to the current point? That, that requires us to compute this ratio. Generally, we don't have to compute the denominator, but we do have to compute the numerator um, for every candidate. And so this involves running the simulation model tens of thousands of times or hundreds of thousands of times for these different candidates. Sometimes we determine it, the value for the candidate. Maybe the value is very low. The posterior for the candidate is very small compared to the posterior for the current place. We reject it. We stick where we are. That's fine. We ran the simulation model for the candidate and decided not to go there. All right? It's, uh, uh, it, some of those we won't have actually uh, sampled uh, from that from that place, okay? So sometimes this involves hundreds of thousands of runs. Um, and uh, generally speaking, we're going to engage in what's called a burn-in period ahead of this, which could itself be hundreds of thousands of runs, but is more commonly maybe 5,000 runs, maybe 10,000, maybe 2,000. But basically, it's to kind of get it to forget the original place we started within this within this um, uh, this chain. This is called a Markov chain here. So we refer to these as chains. And we'll sometimes refer to these as walkers associated with the chain because they're doing random walks. Now in the in the era of large scale com uh, parallel computation, I would note that this is a sequen this is an algorithm which has sequential dependencies. You, it has a current state and you can't go on um, uh, to future walking state without knowing the current state. You can speculatively evaluate things, but the real opportunity for parallelism that's really evident is you can run multiple walkers at the same time. What that means is, you could start these walkers off with different initial values, start them running, for example, on different cores or different, uh, different um, uh, particular machines, um, and, uh, and then basically have them evolving simultaneously. 
And there's a criteria for what's called convergence of this that, that um, can very fruitfully use multiple walkers and ask the degree to which the difference between walkers is similar to the difference within a given walker. If it's pretty similar, that's a sign that walker has converged. It's a sign it's sampling the space quite randomly. By contrast, if the different walkers who, who differed only in starting off from different places and the chance of where they went, if those are a lot more different than what we see within a given walker, it's probably a sign this walker hasn't gone far enough to really sample the space well. Okay, so often we'll have multiple walkers operating in parallel. It turns out there's also a set of diagnostics called the Heidelberg-Welch diagnostics, which, um, which basically seek to assess whether um, a given walker, just taken in isolation, a given walker has gone far enough to be well mixed. Um, and the Heidelberg-Welch diagnostics are well supported in, in an R library we've used for this as well. Um, Okay, so, um, so this involves uh, uh, quite a bit of computational effort. There's typically uh, considerable burden time, a couple thousand at least. Um, and tuning the algorithm's parameters, um, uh, you know, uh, it requires quite a bit of work. So basically you want to get acceptance rates to allow you to explore the space, um, uh, but are big enough that you explore it well, um, and, uh, and you, you want this kind of Goldilocks uh, level of balancing of probability of acceptance and how far you, how far you go. Um, now there's some additional practical concerns. So it turns out that sometimes you will find that there's a high degree of covariation in the sampled values of multiple of these parameters. Take beta, take beta and C. If beta is the probability of transmitting per discordant contact, and C, well, C is the um, number of contacts occurring per unit time, it may be that you can explain the data with different combinations of these. High beta, low C, high C, low beta. Um, it may be that both those offer adequate, you know, adequate explanation of the data such that they have high posterior values associated with both. If it's the case that you have high covariation between these, it turns out you will tend to get structures that are challenging to, effic to efficiently sample in parameter space. So let's suppose we're dealing, just for simplicity of drawing it, with a 2D, a two-dimensional parameter space. So maybe this is C and this is beta, okay? It may be that we, we have a high posterior value for certain regions of the space and very low in others. And maybe in particular, as long as one is high, the other can be low and vice versa, so you get Sorry, this doesn't look that pretty. Looks like a, looks like a worm. Um, maybe a dragon. Um, so let's let's see if I can make that. I'm trying to draw a roughly a hyperbolic um, shape. Boomerang. But the idea. What's that? Boomerang. It's like a boomerang. Yeah. You know boomerang. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I do. Yeah. Um, uh, I I won't go into them. Um, but. Uh, but you know, maybe C can be high, B can be low, or B can be high and C can be low. Um, but it doesn't add up unless unless you know there are multiples of certain things. So in this case, you might have a ridge, right? You might have a sort of a mountain range here that's really high, but it goes down as you go off of that. If it's trying to sample from this, um, it can be challenging for MCMC because remember the the um, the algorithm for MCMC involves this perturbation, involves this picking, typically from a multinomial normal distribution, a value of the parameters, right? And um, 
of, of, of how to perturb the parameters rather from the current place. You have a current place and you're trying to find a candidate. And to pick the candidate, you just pick from a multinomial normal distribution. If you're picking independently from C, from, from B, you might well end up here, 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 you know. And the point is you're not picking intelligently to capture the shape. And if you're picking over long distances, the chances are you may not characterize the shape. So it's very easy to fall off this trajectory. And it doesn't mean that you can't sample for those. Oh, you can yeah, sample just fine. It's just it takes a long time because a lot of the candidates prove unfruitful. So you're picking a lot for every one that you happen to pick on this. Imagine this is even thinner, right? Um, for every one you pick on this thin manifold, you find a lot that are not. And so it tends to be inefficient sampling. It tends to have low acceptance rate. Um, if you have high covariation between parameters. And folks who specialize in this area, like Dr. Liu, have all sorts of tricks to deal with this sort of situation. I mean, one thing you can do is actually transform the space, um, operate in terms of a, of a transform space that captures the covariation. I think you can put in place matrices. Like, if you're picking from a multinomial distribution, maybe you want to use a multinomial covariance for that multinomial normal that will tend to pick things in a certain angles between them. Um, you might also do some tricks with what's called block sampling where you, you pick certain things together and other things based on those, etc. So there's a set of tricks for doing this well. Uh, It's a good question. Um, and yes, it's related to principal components analysis. And I think uh, at times, Lavi, where I've encountered these problems, I've used PCA, I think, to pick out a appropriate eigenvectors involving beta and C, for example, such that um, that will be a transform space. will be like, I don't pick C and beta independently, I pick kind of like C plus beta, or something like that, or C times beta, right? Um, and and, uh, and, and can uh, use that to make it more efficient. Um, so it's related to PCA, it's related to PCA, and in general related to these sort of combinations of parameter values. Um, uh, I think I'll, I'll probably uh, wind down there. Okay, yeah, and as I note, there's many MCMC algorithms, in fact. There's uh, an algorithm known as Gibbs sampling, which, is, which performs successive steps instead of just doing a random, so random walk Metropolis Hastings, which is what we've seen here, is viewed as kind of the, by far the easiest, the conceptually most accessible, um, super easy to implement, but kind of not so efficient. And um, there's a set of, of more sophisticated algorithms um, that seek to make it more efficient. There's one from, I think it's from Gelman um, uh, at, uh, at Columbia, um, NTSC or something like that. It's a really more efficient algorithm that tries to avoid doubling back on itself, sort of like you were asking at, about, I think it was Lafay, uh, either you or Rifat was asking about it, like going, going back and revisiting things, it tries to sort of lower the chance so it instead encourage it to explore. Um, uh, and I know some people are very excited about those, some recent advances there. Um, Gibbs sampling can be used to perform the sampling in a sort of structured way. First you sample these, then these, these successively um, within the course of a given step. And it turns out it can be more uh, efficient. Um, uh, and, and then there's a set of additional sophistication yet if you want to sample from models. I've been dealing with sampling from parameters, but you could imagine 
having within your parameters vector one more thing that's which model you're, you're using this with. Are you using it with model A or model B or model C or model D? And you're now choosing between models. You're saying these sets of parameters work really well with this model. These sets of parameters work really well with this model. These sets work well with these other models. Now, that's, that's a nice, nice idea. Um, and you can do it but it requires real attention. The trickiest part of doing that, of picking between models, is the fact that if the models have different parameter spaces, then if you're in model A, you don't have to worry about this parameter. If you're in model B, you don't have to worry about these other two parameters, but you do have to worry about that third one. Um, and model C, you have to worry about all of them. Um, then it, it, you have to be, careful how how do we capture this interaction of a parameter that parameters are different for different models the parameter spaces from which we're sampling are different for different models and that's the sphere of what's called reverse jump MCMC and Dr. Liu is is quite knowledgeable about uh, about things in that area and from what I understand that's like there's some cutting edge issues in statistics and people argue about how good it really is, et cetera. Um, uh, yeah, so anyway, these are, um, um, right. Um, uh, these are some approaches. I'll just make um, uh, a closing remark here. MCMC is what's known as a batch Monte Carlo algorithm batch in the sense that we've got all the data batched up at once. It's a single vector of data. We're, we're, we're considering all the evidence at a single time. If a new piece of evidence comes in, we have to repeat the whole computation to sample from parameters in light of all that evidence. Even though maybe one measly new piece of evidence came in, we have to recompute the MCMC sample to, to sample from the parameter values. This stands in contrast to sequential Monte Carlo methods, the most prominent by far of which is particle filtering. Particle filtering, as you've seen in this very floor, you know, uh, over past lectures, is a recursively defined algorithm. When a new piece of data comes in, it updates the weights, reflecting that data to get a new estimate of the underlying system state. It doesn't have to go reconsider all the previous data. That's in contrast to MCMC, okay? Um, MCMC is this batch or offline Monte Carlo algorithm. Sequential Monte Carlo methods, and particle filtering in particular, are online methods. Online in the sense that they're, they're waiting for a new piece of data to come in and will act on that to update previous estimates without having to revisit the entire computation, okay? Um, they also focus on a different thing, sampling from the underlying state space. Um, okay, um, so our next lecture, which we will not do now so that I can meet with uh, the student teams and get updates on their work and, and give some guidance. Uh, the next lecture, we will see how to combine these two techniques of particle filtering and MCMC with PMCMC, which combines the best features of both. And that will provide us a technique for sampling from parameters at the same time as sampling the latent state, and we'll in fact have a joint distribution sampled from over trajectories in state space and the parameters um, that, that govern those trajectories for a given model, okay? So that's what PMCMC is going, is going to do, is going to give us. And PMCMC will be sort of the, uh, It'll be kind of the, the head of MCMC and the body of, M, of particle filter. 
okay? Um, uh, it'll, it'll combine the best of each um, to, to yield a very powerful algorithm that can achieve the goals of each, but in a generalized method that the parameter estimates from being sampled with the MCMC component will be informed and potentially very much improved by the ability to estimate latent state. And the ability to understand latent state will be improved in terms of being able to explore the implications uh, for possible values of parameters, okay? So that's what um, our goal is for next time. But for now, I wanna, I wanna see if I can meet with uh, some of the team members, okay? So thank you very much. And we will be scheduling uh, the coming, uh, the next class of this, hopefully for late this week, even if it's early in the morning or late in the day.